Good afternoon. A visit to the comments section of any video on a new train will quickly tell you that modern train seats aren't exactly popular, and any trip on one will bring you to more or less the same conclusion. But it didn't used to be like this, so why is it now? <laughs> We'll first have to go back in time, though, and follow the evolution of the railway seat throughout the ages. In 1830, following the opening of the Liverpool and Manchester Railway, the world's first intercity operation, the lower classes of travel were exposed to extremely uncomfortable travelling conditions, such as wooden benches and no roofs. First class was somewhat better, with carriages being heavily inspired by the stagecoaches of the year before. Indeed, you could even put your stagecoach on a wagon if you wanted, an early form of motor rail, one might say. After this literally bumpy start, things rapidly began to improve, and by the 1880s companies such as the Midland Railway were offering truly opulent travelling environments and some of the most fantastic seats ever seen in history. That's not just on a train, that's in general. By the turn of the century, train seat design was characterised by frames that were built into the structure of the train, and extremely cushioned seating. They were often covered with elaborate and beautiful maquette, but perhaps the most notable thing was the fact that most seating was arranged in compartments, as opposed to the open format we know today. This came with both benefits and downsides. Whilst it was more private for the passengers, it did sometimes lead to awkward encounters, and was more complicated to operate. But compartment seating persisted as the dominant form of accommodation in trains until the 1950s, when the new, standardised Mark I format was brought into place. This was broadly similar to trains that had come before, except for the fact that 2 plus 2 seating around bays of tables were now beginning to complement compartments on a massive scale. Airline seating was still completely far-fetched at this time. The seats may have been less ornate than in times past, but they were still very well padded, even if the ergonomics weren't exactly up to much. Things remained more or less similar until the advent of the Mark III coaches with the HST in the 1970s. First class was now out of its compartments and in a 2 plus 1 configuration. Second class remained 2 plus 2, but airline seats were beginning to creep in, if sparingly. The seats themselves were the IC70s. These were certainly impressive. You didn't so much sit on them as sink into them. They were essentially a liquid. They were ridiculously soft and very well padded, though hardly the best ergonomically. They sort of were built into a natural recline and didn't have high backs, which meant if you were tall you were forced to slouch more or less. All that said though, the IC70, in particular the first class variant, was exceedingly comfortable. Following privatisation in the 1990s, there was an explosion in seat design, with different companies choosing different styles all across the country. By now, there was more an emphasis on ergonomics as opposed to sheer padding, and personal space also became a major element of design, with seats being clearly distinct from each other. I don't really think there are any terrible seats in this era. There were certainly some bad ones, but nothing so abhorrent that it would put you off rail travel. All this changed though in June 2016, with the introduction of one very special type of EMU, the Class 700. Whilst it wasn't the first application of such a seat, it was the Class 700 that popularised the term ironing board to describe them, and, well, they were not popular. This is very much understandable. The seats are hideously uncomfortable, are very thin and provide absolutely no padding, or none that you could notice anyway. The 700 seats were terrible, but there was still some hope that it was just a one-off and things would improve in the years to follow. But it didn't. In 2017, just one year after the introduction of the 700s, the Class 800s entered Zerbeth was GWR, and well, they were arguably worse. Whilst the seats themselves were physically more tolerable, the trains would be operating over much longer distances, up to 8 hours in some cases, and they were just not cutting it. This was bad enough, but then the same seats, the Fanes of Sofia, began to be rolled out on almost every new intercity train in the country. Too many other trains to mention were also fitted with terrible seating, so it was with much relief that Greater Anglia announced that they were going to make sure that the seats in their class 745 and 755 trains were of the highest quality. But were they? Well, sort of. They're not amazing, and I don't find them particularly comfortable. But they're not terrible, and that was enough to blow everyone's socks off. But this is precisely the problem. 
How can a seat that's so mediocre at best and poor at worst manage to be considered good, especially when seats from a decade earlier were far better? In the early 2010s, EN 45545-2, the European Railway Standard for Fire Safety, was released. This covered several things, but primarily focused on the ability of railway vehicle components to withstand fire damage. This, of course, included seats. Now, I would have liked to have read the standard myself, but it would have set me back around 700 euros, and therefore I was a little reluctant. But anyway, in response to the new code, Britain's Rail Safety and Standards Board, otherwise known as the RSSB, started testing existing British seat designs to see if they held up to the new regulations. According to the new standards, the higher the blue bar, the more dangerous the seat was, at least with regards to fire risk. Now, I'm no expert with data, but I think I can see a slight problem with these results. However, it falls into place at about the right time, and would therefore seem to be a plausible explanation as to the lack of comfort in modern train seats. But this can't be the whole story. When the RSSB was asked whether this was the reason why Thameslink's Class 700 suits were so brutally uncomfortable, their response was a rather clear no. Instead, the finger was pointed at the Department for Transport for being too frugal with their specifications. I certainly wouldn't put it past the DFT. They've made some pretty ridiculous decisions in the past, and it's definitely in character to specify trains to be uncomfortable. Furthermore, Many other European countries have managed to create seats that are both comfortable and meet the new regulations, so why can't Britain do it? But then again, the standard has quite clearly eliminated many older and more comfortable seats, so it's probably a mix of both reasons, to be honest. But all that said, I do think the standards are too strict. They discuss the threat that vandals pose to setting seats alight, but in order to do that, they'd need to cut through the fire-resistant coating of foam, and that's really hard to do, especially unnoticed. I mean, look at it. Furthermore, they'd have to do this to every seat if they wanted flames to spread, which is just impossible. So why are they so intent on massively reducing passenger comfort and potentially reducing passenger numbers just to prepare for this incredibly improbable event, that even if it were to occur, passengers could easily be evacuated to another coach? Other than cost savings, I have absolutely no idea. But you might. So please let me know if you do. I'd be very interested to hear. Anyway, that's not the point. We've got to talk about moving forward. Of course, Britain left the EU in 2020, and therefore it's theoretically possible to change the legislation to allow a higher standard of comfort. But I still don't think this will be the right decision. It would make interoperability with Europe harder, and would make it more difficult to rejoin the EU if we decided to do so in the future. So, what can we do? Well, the RSSB did make a sort of electric chair-looking thing where they measured exactly what people's preferences were with regards to different seat angles, pitches, depths, and so on, and therefore made it theoretically possible to craft a perfect train seat. The guidelines laid out in this report should really be made into law, and whilst that's difficult to do, I think the benefits far outweigh the consequences. If you don't agree with me, try travelling from Brighton to Cambridge on a Class 700, and I think you'll soon be one round. Ultimately though, why does this matter? I mean, seat comfort isn't that big a factor when it comes to people choosing to travel by rail. Well, no, but it is a key factor in people's enjoyment of a journey, and that's something we should really be striving to improve. You often hear people complaining that the railways aren't what they once were, and things have been better in the past. But it doesn't have to be this way. I mean, we've got potential now, arguably more than ever before, to make the railway a fantastic one. And a good place to start would be seats. Thank you very much for watching, feel free to join my Discord server as always, and goodbye.